I sort of enjoy um, perusing philosophy, but rather than embracing, you know, Plato or Nietzsche or Buddhism or whatever, I think all of it is important. I like to consider it an open proposition and that it remain open. I was born in 1949 in, in Berkeley, California, but really did not grow up there. My parents met both doing PhDs at Berkeley, but we moved almost immediately. My father was doing a, a postdoc in Zurich. He was, I don't know, studying philosophy and learning to play the guitar. And, and one of the things they were doing was painting and in oil paint. and. While they were painting the landscape out the uh, off of uh, in the backyard or whatever, I started painting uh, blue triangles and red squares. And I had a book, and it was a big fat book of modern art. And this was in the early '60s. And that book had, you know, obviously Clay and Kandinsky and Mondrian, Malevich, and all the greats of modernism to that point, and just barely a hint of Pollock and Rothko and Newman and, and the the Americans. But I just immediately fell in love with this range of, of thinking and immediately gravitated to the language of abstraction that I saw in Kandinsky and Paul Klee and others. And at the same time, I was equally compelled by surrealism, de Chirico, but especially of Yves Tanguy. That range has stuck with me, I think, throughout, so that I still in my practice have work that is very architectonic, very structured, very external, very ordered, very spatial, very external in some ways, and work that is much more visceral, liquid, internal, abject even at times. Those aspects of modernism have always um, stuck with me in a very concise way. And in some respects, I, I never quite absorbed uh, American pop or the various ironies of postmodernism into a vocabulary. Jazz was definitely an influence just because I feel like I understood it as music in, in such abstract form, in its complexity, could provide an incredible amount of energy, and it still is really what drives my practice in the studio. I went to college at, and ended up at the museum school in, in the late 60s. I wanted to get off the East Coast and, and get out to the West Coast for uh, graduate school. So after that year off, I ended up in Seattle at the University of Washington. Jacob Lawrence was there, and that was a huge gift. It was just a remarkable man who I remained friends with well after I graduated from school and loved talking to him about Black Mountain College and the Harlem Renaissance, and especially about, about jazz, and then fell in with a remarkable dealer with whom I was with for 22 years. Her name was Linda Ferris. She just was a truly exceptional art dealer who really trusted in her artists and allowed me to do all sorts of installations and site-specific work in the gallery. The process is, is always self-generating. It's rarely hung on a, an exogenous concept or narrative. And, and I'm even suspect of thinking that I want to go in a particular direction. If I, if I know that, I tend to sort of throw myself a knuckleball and, and, and derail and throw in a, a color or a form that really is, is dissonant or oppositional to where I'm going, just as, as a, almost a problem to solve. There is such an emphasis on consistency and, and, and branding and identity and, and uh, a more logical, teleological progression in one's work. I've, I've just arrived at a point where I embrace, as much as anything, the, the, the kind of breadth of what I'm attempting to do. And I suspect it isn't really all that wildly different than what a lot of artists do. I mean, in our household, rather than paintings or, or other 
things, we, we had maps of the world. My father was obsessed with, with maps. And as kids, I, I still think I'm kind of obsessed with mapping just as a way of engaging with the world. And the gift from my father that I really am so grateful for is his deep engagement with curiosity. And he didn't have a great, great interest in, in art, even as he was giving me a a big book on Kandinsky when I was a little kid. Curiosity in life is, is a major, major gift, and I think it's something that can keep one alive in the process of art making, for sure. I got involved with AAA as a result of several women, Emily Berger and Nancy Manter, who introduced me to the organization. I was open to, um, to joining. It's an extraordinary uh, organization. It goes back to uh, abstraction in the, in the 30s in the United States and trying to make a case for abstraction for modern art at a time when a lot of American art was really much more provincial and narratively driven. And I was a, a little bit questioning of whether I really was going to be a, a logical fit for this organization because I think of my work as being really quite impure and hybrid and just not formally rigorous enough. But I, I was pleased to, in, in looking at the um, list of people who had been a part of this organization at one point or another, I found two people who have really have been major influences in my, in my life, at least at a, at a formative time. And one is Sam Gilliam, who was a big influence on some of the early scrolls that I was doing back in the early 70s. And the other is, is, is Robert Smithson, who was a, a major influence uh, in, in graduate school uh, especially. And so I was surprised to find those two individuals part of the organization. Being in art school in the early 70s, that was still very much in the air, you know, late Greenberg. But minimalism, Judd's writings and, and Robert Morris, and there was a, a lot going on that was counter to the teleology that Greenberg had been laying out, that there was a, a logical progression towards the autonomous, to, towards the pure. I think that was something that, that there was a lot of reaction against. And, and certainly in, in somebody like Smithson, I found impurity, immateriality, because he sort, sort of even thought of language as material, as mud. Even in that kind of thinking, I found provocation that I was attracted to. I've never myself been interested in pushing towards a particular destination that would somehow be the resolute or resolve my thinking. I think the notebooks in some way keep me um, open to new possibilities. I love the idea that when I'm on the subways drawing in my small, smaller notebooks that there, there's a certain kind of jitteriness the way you draw just because of the motion of the train and that that aspect of the world is going to come in and kind of muck with you and throw off whatever it is you might, whatever straight line you think you might be able to draw. I think the work kind of has to stand on its own a little bit uh, at a distance from meaning or the specifics of certain kinds of readings. And I, I tend to be suspect of placing meanings too close to, to the work. Uh, I, I feel like it handicaps, the, uh, handicaps me to, to have that spe those specifics of generative meaning, but it handicaps the viewer, and I would rather put a, a different kind of stress on the viewer that where he, she is on their own a little bit.